Today is Friday, July 18th, 2014. My name is Jason Higgins and I'm an intern with the Oklahoma Oral History Research Program. I'm in Stillwater at the OSU Library to interview Dr. Ronald Beard, former executive assistant to the president at Kent State University during the time of the Kent State Massacre. Dr. Beard is retired from, the Oklahoma, from Oklahoma State University. This is part of the Spotlighting Oklahoma Oral History Project. Dr. Beer, I would like to thank you for joining me today. Thank you for the opportunity. Let's begin with your background. Tell me about when and where you were born in your hometown. Sure. I was born in, in a little farming community of Cisna Park, Illinois, a community of 850 people. Uh, primary focus was obviously in supporting farmers and ranchers, agriculture. Uh, grew up there. Um, my senior year in high school, had somebody said I was going to go to college, I would have thought they were from Mars because I had absolutely no concept of doing that. But my father, for some strange reason, insisted that I continue to deliver the Danville Commercial News, and there was a scholarship competition. He insisted that I apply. I did. Long story short, uh, I got a scholarship, didn't know where to go. My best friend was going to Illinois State, and so I went to Illinois State, about 65 miles from my hometown. I did a degree in music education and knew by my junior year I wasn't going to be a musician. You can't do that when you can't play the drums or piano. <laughs> so I meet, upon graduation, I, I went to Michigan State for a master's degree. And uh, one weekend after completing about half my doctoral work there, I went to Kent, Ohio, to visit a friend who had been a colleague in a residence hall next to the one that I served in. And his boss said, why don't you come to work for me? Uh, long story short, I did, and was assistant dean of men at Kent State, and um, occupied several positions in the student services there. Well, before we get to your time at Kent, um, can you talk a little bit about your parents, your uh, family, how large yeah, was your family? Sure, yeah. Seven children. Father had to drop out of high school because of the death of his father, and he had three sisters, and so he you know, worked to support them. Um, he delivered gasoline to farmers in bulk tank. Um, he was a firm believer in keeping his children occupied, so we, all of us, delivered papers. Uh, we had at one time about 500 rabbits that we butchered on weekends, which didn't make us popular with the neighbor girls. <laughs> but we sold those meat on the street um, and had sheep as uh, for a 4-H FFA project. Uh, had a horse and had a little barn in town. We were called a townie, uh, although we uh, did a lot of work. All my relatives lived on the farm, and so a lot of time was spent there. Um, we had mink, about 500 mink. Uh, which is really minimal when it comes to me. You've got to have thousands if you're going to make a living that way. But uh, I think my father, uh, who really just scraped a by, uh, had visions of something greater. And uh, when my older brother left and I left, and my younger, the, second, the third child was a, a brother, male, and he tried for a couple of years after high school to, to make something happen. Didn't work. And so he left. My mother passed away when I was um, a freshman, my first semester of freshman, which was a difficult time. Um, I almost didn't succeed in, in, at Illinois State because of that. But we recovered and graduated, and um, my mother was a stay-at-home mom, uh, with a close-knit family. The only place we ever traveled was to the southeastern corner of Iowa to visit her parents, my grandparents there. Um, a small town, you just, we didn't, we didn't vacation, we didn't eat out, we, it was just a very simple rural life. Did you walk to school? Always. <laughs> How yes. far was the walk? Or a bicycle, we had bicycles to, to transport papers. It was a little town, so it wasn't difficult. You could get from one end to the other on a bike in 10 minutes. Okay. Uh, a walk would maybe 15, 20 minutes. Talk uh, a little bit about your formative education years. Um, what? Your formative educational years, grade school, high yeah, school. Yeah, um, 
grade school, I, I think there was a the principal who was also a shop teacher where you made things oh, yeah. from wood. Hmm. And he held a an activity uh, every Wednesday night for children who wanted to participate. And so he would teach us. It wasn't part of the instructional program, but he would teach us how to work with wood and machinery. Hmm. And uh, made bookends and birdhouses and things of that nature, um, and we always played games uh, at the very end, maybe for a half hour. So it created a sense of community, a, a relationship, and so other than that, it was a matter of once uh, moving through the eighth grade, went down to the high school, which is on the other end of town, perhaps um, a mile from my house, and um, I was actively involved in various organizations. Um, didn't, it wasn't, I was going to say it wasn't much of a high school, and that's not a good thing to say. It was limited because we didn't have uh, instructors for foreign language. Uh, mathematics was um, limited, uh, basic math and algebra and trig. Beyond that, you didn't have it. So uh, we had some basic science of physics and biology, um, geography, English, math, and those kinds of things, but uh, but it was a fairly simple, we, we didn't have football, we weren't large enough, did have a basketball team that was fairly good, uh, and track team. Uh, we didn't participate because we were always occupied with chores for the animals and delivering papers um, six nights a week and on Sunday morning. So Was this an integrated school as well? Well, interesting question. Uh, there were no African Americans in our, our community. And I contend that there was an unwritten law or statute or <laughs> attitude that no blacks after dark. Really? No. And so we never we never met or or interacted with or related to uh, people other than basic Caucasian. It was a very conservative community. There was a huge church of which my parents were members called Apostolic Christian, and once you became a member of that and your parents would uh, wish for you to do that in your early teens, 12, 13, 14, and um, you, didn't, you didn't go to sports activities, you didn't go to movies, they didn't wear jewelry or makeup, uh, uh, men and women sat on opposite sides of the church, there was no musical instrumentation. Wow. It was just a very conservative, but a very dedicated group of people. Interesting. Something happened to a farmer or something, there were 15, 20 people within an hour to either milk the cows, uh, bring in the harvest, plant the seed, plow the fields, whatever. I mean, it was just a very loving, caring place. Everybody cared for everybody. There were some other churches, hmm. small, Lutheran and Methodist, as I recall. Uh, no Catholic church. Uh, there may have been Catholic, but they probably went to another community to uh, worship. Um, and so it was only when I went to college that I was really introduced to other people. And interestingly, um, one of the individuals with whom I became very close was um, from um, Vietnam. Um, a little guy, a, a good friend of mine and I were walking across the campus and a little guy dragging three heavy suitcases and hair like Dagwood <laughs> was struggling to get someplace. And so we stopped. He was very reluctant to, to allow us to take his luggage to help him. But we did. And as it turns out, he was assigned to the same floor of the residence hall. So we became very, very close friends. Uh, on Yoon Kim. Um, and so, um, yeah, it was early introduction, became very close to, to several African Americans that lived in the hall, um, basketball players, musicians, um, yeah, it was not a problem once we made the acquaintance. Um, but I think it was an extension of what I learned as a youngster and growing up in a community that uh, you were a community. I, I mean. We never thought about, in fact, I'm not sure we had a key for the front door. Right. Just never concerned yourself about locking that or taking the key out of the ignition of your car or truck. And just 
I mean, it was that, that was that kind of community. That kind of community sounds beneficial to the Great Depression era and the years afterwards, yeah. absolutely. My grandmother and my father would have been coming out, of, my, my father would have been coming out of that. Yeah, mm -hmm. sure. So, um, once you got to your undergraduate university and you made friends with African Americans and uh, Vietnamese, um, were you impacted at all initially by the Cold War rhetoric of the time? Um, well, I, I knew uh, of the Korean War and I had an uncle that was in World War II that had been injured. In fact, uh, he brought with him the rifle pin, he was in the infantry, hmm. that had been hit by a bullet on one end and shaved everything off of it and exited, I guess it was this way, because it went in and just missed his heart, came out his back. And um, my older brother was not uh, drafted. We had the draft in those days hmm. because he had had um, scarlet fever as a youngster and had some effect on his heart. I went to college and knew that there was a war, was concerned about that, went to graduate school and one day received a letter that said, Beer, you've been in school long enough. It's time for you to take your physical for the draft. What year was that? Um, must have been 60 or about 59 because I was in okay. Michigan, I was in Lan East Lansing, Michigan at Michigan State. Mm -hmm. So I went to Detroit to do my physical, um, came back and uh, ironically the war ended before my number came up. Hmm. Interesting. So I, my younger brother volunteered <coughs> as a conscientious objector because he had joined that church. Mm -hmm. And he served in a medic unit, um, and he never went abroad, mm. but but he was a, a veteran out of that war, and so the war ended. Um, but these, uh, this atmosphere didn't really contribute to or hinder your ability to create relationships with yeah. Vietnamese yeah. people, African no. Americans. That's no. interesting. Tell me a little bit about your undergraduate university. Who? if anyone inspired you to pursue educational career? Mm -hmm. Well, um, Illinois State at that time had about, uh, I'm going to say, 3,500 students, fairly small. Originally a teacher's college. Mm -hmm. At one time it was Illinois State Teachers, uh, no, Illinois State Normal University. There was one <clears throat> and in Illinois, um, state, which was central, Illinois Northern, Illinois Eastern, Illinois Western, and Illinois Southern. University of Illinois, Champaign-Urbana was the parent institution. <clears throat> it changed while I was there to Illinois State University. As indicated earlier, I went there only because a friend was going there. I had no idea where to go, really what to do. <clears throat> I was into choirs and, and the band in high school. I loved to sing. We had family that sang. All of us played an instrument. In fact, we had our really our own little band, uh, except for a drummer. <laughs> but I had two sisters that played piano and, and a brother that played the clarinet and a sister that played in the clarinet and the saxophone and oboe, um, another sister that played the flute, a brother that played the sousaphone or baritone. I played the trumpet. So I, I'm, I was a double major. And musicians tend to be um, very warm, accepting people. Right. I was in the men's glee club and, and the mixed choir. Um, we had an extraordinarily loving woman who was the head of the department, fairly elderly. Huh. <clears throat> it didn't take long, though, to uh, respect her for what she was and her skills. Huh. Um, but as I went through that, I, I did all right. I mean, I learned all the instruments and sang and learned music theory and history and all those things. But when I discovered that I couldn't play the drums and, or the piano, I just wasn't coordinated. And to this day, I don't understand how people can play different rhythms with different extensions of their body. <laughs> but they do, obviously. Right. <laughs> so I, I was very active in my uh, later years in college, junior and senior. 
and was elected the president of the senior class. And so I came to know the vice president for student services very well. Hmm. So I went to him one day um, and said, how do you become what you are? Hmm. He explained that there are programs at the graduate level that one can pursue and he gave me Michigan State, Indiana State, or in University of Indiana, Ohio State, University of Minnesota as uh, institutions that were well known. I applied to those. The reason I selected Michigan State was because one of my friends from Illinois State was going there. <laughs> so I said, well, that's a good place to go. If he's going there, I can, I can go and I'll know someone. Absolutely. So I got my little car and, and went to Michigan State, was the director of residence hall while I was there. Hmm. And um, Were you the first in your family to attend college? My brother went to um, University of Illinois. <coughs> um, I'm not sure on how he got there. I think maybe a scholarship because our family. Ju there's no way our father could contribute to that. I mean, we we delivered newspapers and sold rabbits um, to generate money to buy shoes. And uh, my grandmother, with whom we lived, uh, made a lot of our clothes, as did my mother. Uh, we lived across from a grain elevator, and so when you went to buy food, pellets for rabbits or sheep or a horse, <clears throat> you, you selected the, the bag of food based on the print or the color of the bag because you knew it was going to be pajamas, a shirt, our sisters would get dresses that were generally made from that cloth. So you come from a strong working class. Yes, right very much so. Um, so, any memorable experiences at uh, Michigan State or your undergraduate that you care to discuss? Um, Illinois State was a very pleasant place. It was a happy time for me once I recovered from the death of my mother. Mm -hmm. uh, made a lot of friends, um, took some of them back to my house on weekends for vacation. Um, it was a joyful time. We, we had a good time. I met a lot of people, including several young ladies, uh, one of whom said, if you can't make a commitment uh, for marriage, uh, this relationship is done. <laughs> she had left school after sophomore year to go to nursing school, and I said, well, I, I'm, I'm not prepared. I, there's no way I could support a marriage. And so we parted and went our own separate way. Uh, being involved in student activities back then, we had what was called the Big Four. I was part of that committee, and, and so we invited um, four times a year the big bands, uh, Glenn Miller and uh, all of the big names. Bands were on our little campus, and mm -hmm. it was very formal. Girls dressed in formals with the large uh, petticoats underneath and very colorful. Um, guys were always dressed up in suit and tie, some in tux. Uh, when we sang as a men's glee club, we were always in tuxedo. When we uh, performed the Messiah every year as a choral group, several hundred in, in the choir, we were in tux and the women were in colorful formal, so it, it made an incredible picture, really. And that was a memorable experience for me. I, I continue to sing in church choirs, I have for about 50 years. And um, if we do the Messiah, it brings back uh, some very wonderful emotional memories. Absolutely. <clears throat> it seems that music is a big part of your life. How did the rock and roll era influence you, or did it? <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting. I, I never really tied into that. I, I, um, I like jazz. Uh, I like classical stuff. Um, I, I don't relate well to opera. Um, but, you know, rock and roll was um, really different. Um, it was a fun kind of thing, but I just never really got tied into that heavily. Once I decided I wasn't any longer going to be a teacher of music, mm -hmm. <clears throat> I, I turned my focus to, to something considerably different. Okay. Um, so throughout <coughs> your time at graduate school. Graduate school can be rather uh, difficult at times. What kept you going and pursuing the field in education? <clears throat> that too is an interesting question. Uh, I was frankly shocked at myself 
as a person who had no aspiration to go to college, I, I was unfamiliar with people who went to college. Not very many people from our community went to college. Mm -hmm. I think maybe three or four other guys in my class. I, I don't know of any women that, that went on to college. It was usually stay home for the women, get married for the guys, um, drive a milk truck, a grain truck, work on a farm, mm -hmm. uh, uh, implement dealer, feed store, okay. maybe work in a tavern. <laughs> <clears throat> of which there were three in this small town, in a grocery store and a gas station, but that was about it, right. post office. Um, so, uh, where was I going with that? <laughs> the, your, your well, uh, the, the education was kind of a new frontier for you. Oh, I, yes, what, what it was. And, and the master's degree, <clears throat> once I knew I wasn't going to be a music teacher, I said, you know, what are you going to do? I expended this energy and time and, and financial resources of somebody else. So I thought perhaps being a counselor in a high school. Mm. We didn't have one. But I learned uh, at the university level that there were such. And so that's why I went into counselor education um, to work with young people. I then learned about student personnel work, uh, deans of students, deans of men, deans of women at that time. I uh, work in a university community, but it was really the high school focus that I, I thought I would pursue. And when I got there, I, I also realized that there were positions at the university level. Hmm. By a stroke of luck, I went to visit my friend at uh, Kent. Hmm. There happened to be an open position. I think the social function to which I was invited when I was there created a uh, almost an immediate relationship with this gentleman, mm. not my friend, but uh, his boss. And, uh, and the fact that he offered me a job was just astounding. Right. But I was unattached. Um, I had completed a fair share, maybe three-fourths of my doctoral work, and I expressed that concern to him. I said, I really need to go back. He said, ah, you can do that here. Go back in the summers. That's not a problem for us. Well, I didn't do that. So I went back two summers to Michigan State to take more coursework. Um, but I met a co-ed. I, I was on staff, uh, which created an interesting situation. But my wife to, now, uh, then-to-be, was a senior. And um, it was one of those um, feelings that this is the one. And so after about nine months of uh, courting, we got married. And, but I was introduced to her by the guy that offered me the job. Wow. So I'm, I'm deeply indebted to this man who then served as my mentor for about 19 years. Hmm. Uh, he was the dean of students. What was this gentleman's name? At uh, Kent State. Hmm. And <clears throat> he introduced me to this young lady. He's the one that affected my being the acting dean of men when it was vacant, and then went back to assistant dean of men for residential life. And then he persuaded me to go down to the president's office as research assistant, uh, which allowed me to devote more time and energy to finishing the PhD. I had gone up to Case Western Reserve in Cleveland for a couple courses, and then I took the final courses at Kent State, finished up the, the doctorate, uh, finished the dissertation and the prelims and all that kind of stuff. And in 69 got the degree and um, worked very closely with him. I went down to the president's office, research assistant, and there was, it was there about two years and he then asked me to uh, be the director of alumni relations. I, I really resisted that. <laughs> But when the president asks you to do something, um, it's a pretty serious invitation. And, right. <laughs> and I, he said, we, we just have to turn the program around. It's not doing anything. Mm -hmm. And he said, I, I think you've got the skills to do that. And so I agreed by making a deal and said, I will give every effort for two years to accomplish that. I did. He then upheld his end of the deal by bringing me back to his office as his executive assistant because that position had come open at the end of my two years. That gentleman went to Bowling Green University, so in 68 I became his executive assistant. 
So it seems to me like you had a unique relationship both with the students and with the president himself. Very much so. Um, can you describe the dem demography of the student body at Kent State during 69, 70? Were they working sure. less? Or? A lot of first generation. Hmm. A, a fairly good number from the urban areas. Uh, we were just 15 miles east of Akron, mm. about 60 miles west of Youngstown, about 35 miles north of Canton, and about the same distance south of Cleveland. So we had a lot of young people whose parents worked in factories. The three major tire companies were in Akron. Hmm. Firestone, Goodyear, and Goodrich, their headquarters, their manufacturing plants at that right. time were there. Right. Steel plants in Youngstown, which is a very thriving community at that point. Canton mm -hmm. was the home to Hoover vacuum cleaners and several other major industries. So it was a thriving community. And Cleveland at that time was likewise mm -hmm. thriving. Um, during those years, um, there was initially fairly frequent requests from the African-American population that came out of Cleveland and Akron for the most part. There were some out-of-state folks from the East, which introduced a Jewish population that became not significant, but uh, identifiable to be sure. Another population or ethnic group to who to which I had very little introduction previous to that. Um, and they were requesting greater assistance. It was at the time of the civil rights movements in the mid-60s, right. and so there were demonstrations focusing on uh, rights for black students, more financial aid, more counseling, more faculty and staff, that represented their ethnicity, uh, their culture. Um, there were some demonstrations in 68, 69, some popular at that time were sit-ins, uh, a group of students predominantly uh, that would go into a class that was in session and go up to the front and sit in, uh, which created obviously disruption in the sense of uh, interfering with a faculty member's delivery, right. um, concern by students, some of which opposed that and made that known by their expression. Others were empathetic, and so it created a bit of friction in classrooms. Um, and when that happened, <clears throat> the Ohio Highway Patrol, a very well-trained professional organization, I had not had much exposure to law enforcement prior to that. We, in my little hometown, we had a, a um, chief of police who ran a gas station, <laughs> you know, and he was primarily on duty at night, mm -hmm. maybe from six to midnight, just to make sure that the, the kids in town were behaving and <laughs> not right. racing in the streets and all that kind of stuff, not mm -hmm. drinking beer illegally and right. whatnot. But they were very professional. So they were called to the campus when the sit-ins became uh, difficult mm -hmm. to proceed uh, with the function of the institution, as teaching classes. Right. Uh, and they would come in and announce that they were there because this was considered a disruption. Um, we'll provide you five minutes to depart. Uh, should you fail to do that, you will be arrested. Uh, we will do everything we can to make that uh, a non-threatening, non-physical uh, activity. Uh, but we will take you out. We have a bus, and you will be uh, photographed and fingerprinted and taken to jail. Just straightforward. Wow. And those that didn't leave uh, were processed accordingly. But in, in the two and a half years where that happened, Never once do I ever recall <clears throat> an African-American student being critical of the way they were treated. Right. Uh, they were very careful of how they handled them, usually two officers that would take them by the arm and lead them, and if they were resistant, they just picked them up by the arm 
and carried them to the bus and uh, took them to the jail where they were processed and released for the most part immediately. What you're describing sounds a lot like to me like the nonviolent <laughs> resistance movement inspired by Gandhi and Martin Luther King with the civil rights movement yeah. rather than this kind of radical anti-war demonstration yeah. where the, they're more chaotic. Um, it evolved into that though, Jason. Interesting. Um, once the Vietnam War became contentious, there were those that were strongly against our involvement in aggressive military action anywhere. Hmm. There was also an attitude at that time because the the hippie movement was emerging. Right. The flower children, uh, the long hair, the tattoos, the earrings in various body locations, uh, the torn pants. Um, um, free love, um, many would go to these major concerts that were held mm -hmm. for long weekends. Um, so that movement was also emerging at the same time. In fact, they tried to engage the African American students in their protests. Hmm. And, and they were a bit more stringent in what they were doing, um, and they eventually became violent. So uh, their attempts to, um, I don't know if mobilize is the right word, but, but to inspire the African American yeah, yeah, the yeah. African American rejected. work? Rejected. They said, we are not going to see our cause diminished by merging with a completely different issue. Right. And we still believe very firmly that our rights historically have been violated, the institution is not responding to our requests, and those eventually became demands. Hmm. Uh, there was then the Black United Student uh, movement that was created there, a fairly small uh, group, but more um, demanding than what the general student body, African American student body was saying. We had uh, a Black Student Association, this was the Black United Students, um, related to SNCC and um, other African American movements in Chicago, Cleveland, New York. Kent, Ohio is about 20 miles or so off of that major interstate from Chicago to New York. Hmm. That was heavily trafficked by the hippie element which moved into a more um, intense issue of um, demonstrating against big business, which was they contended supporting a war, pressuring Nixon to do more, become more involved, um, business that was all about the bottom line of money and profit. Uh, they became obsessed with uh, reacting to that. And the really hardcore that emerged out of that was saying that we believe in communism and we are committed to making a change and we will bring down big business, whatever that requires. Would you consider that group a small minority of the student body? Very, yes, very. Okay. But, but very insistent, very brazen, mm -hmm. uh, very confident, Articulate, I think, bright mm -hmm. young people that were truly and sincerely expressing a, a deep held, deeply held belief hmm. that America was uh, becoming uh, focused on um, business, on uh, profit, uh, ignoring the needs of the black community. And, and others that would be uh, in poverty, poor, and that it was uh, veering off on a path that they found to be unacceptable. And um, declaring themselves as communist obviously felt that there ought to be more communal activity mm. and sharing of wealth um, to the point that it, it eventually led to the violence, um, destruction of property at Kent State. Interesting. Um, was there a strong women's rights presence on the campus, feminist 
group, were they involved in any of these um, demonstrations? I would say minimal at that time compared to the um, racial issue, the civil rights issue, mm -hmm. and the war issue, and the mm -hmm. business. Um, didn't hear a lot about that, maybe once in a while, uh, but there were no major speakers that were brought to the campus. There were some major speakers that students convinced to come against the war. Mm -hmm. um, the name of the of, of one of the more popular, uh, well-known persons escapes me at the moment, but he was the one that that was um, uh, speaking loudly about uh, this movement is so important. You need to kill your parents. Now that was a metaphor in the sense of uh, if your parents are a part of this uh, business uh, world and supportive of the government, you need to distance yourself from them um, and join, join the, uh, the effort. What you're describing is very complex demography of the student body there, and one that, not completely unsurprising, could not be described as a privilege student by such as what uh, one might think of with Berkeley or Columbia mm, yeah. and you think of wealthy to upper middle class students but you're describing a very working class background yeah, student very body. Much so. Interesting and the more radical these extreme left wing radicals were a small minority um, a significant African American uh, community on the campus. Um, so my question is how active was the majority? Were they ambivalent? Uh, were they apathetic to these demonstrations? Uh, the common student, mm -hmm. you would think. Mm -hmm. Can you describe that? Your description about that culture was correct. And many youngsters, first time, first generation, going to college, working class families, Many of them left on the weekend because they had because they had jobs at home, and and with uh, Canton, Akron, Cleveland, Youngstown, comparatively close, it wasn't difficult within an hour. Mm -hmm. Even Pittsburgh, from which we had a fairly reasonable contingent, so students, a, a fair number of students, went home on the weekends. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think it was um, probably ambivalence. And, and saying, you know, what are these people all about? Uh, our country, we've got housing and food and reasonable transportation, and this is an opportunity. I'm not going to jeopardize. I don't want to get kicked out of school uh, or discipline because I'm, I'm doing something. I, I think many of them resisted the hippie, uh, long hair, dirty, torn pants, and saying, you know, what are these? Get a life. You know, you've right. got to get a job. You can't just live off the land and <laughs> and then there was a moral issue of this whole free love movement right. um, and and the songs that, that came to reflect that um, uh, Mary Paul and <laughs> there were three of them I, I'm not remembering those very well but but yeah I think they went about their business. Hmm. Uh, for the most part. Um, some of them were curious and so they would listen, they may take some literature. A lot of literature came off of that interstate where cars would come through and usually old rickety vehicles that was about all they could afford because um, they'd crash with friends or people. Frequently we'd find them in a residence hall sleeping in a lounge because I mean these were visitors, people passing through and their vehicles would be loaded with literature that they would leave on the campus and resist the war and, and uh, take down this uh, bunch of people that are focused just on profit and wealth and unwilling to share kind of stuff. But, but it, it didn't really strike a large number that, that I think they saw this as a small element over here that wasn't really making a lot of progress and connecting very well with the larger world. Well, in, in many ways, the student-led demonstrations had reached their pinnacle earlier in 68 yeah. with yeah. the Democratic yeah. National right. Convention. That's right. Um, and the black student. Group. Right, right. And <clears throat> so with 
the faculty? Were there teaching such as what occurred earlier in the anti-war movement, such as at the University of Wisconsin? Did the faculty support these demonstrations? In about the same portion as the student population. There so was a minority. small group, Jerry Lewis in sociology, was, was probably the leader hmm. uh, of that element, and, and some from political science, some from philosophy. Uh, so there was a handful, a, a, a small minority that uh, attempted to get the faculty governance group, faculty council, faculty senate, um, to pass legislation, to articulate the feeling of the faculty. Generally that didn't go anywhere. Uh, it was voted down by those who said, I'm here to teach history or geography or music or architecture or whatever. And so there was not a large, uh, there, were, there were probably half a dozen or a dozen that, that would, were, were supportive of the uh, activities, uh, the suggestions of the, uh, that small core of, of hard, uh, really what a lot of people would have said left wing right. um, people. I think they expressed concern about the frequency of reference to violence, uh, bombing with gasoline bottles, um, um, overturning vehicles, um, breaking into banks to upset the flow. I'm not so sure it was about money as it was interfering with the progress of the business day. Um, so it was about proportional. And um, prior to the events in early May 1970. Um, you had a, a working relationship with the president. Was he concerned with these demonstrations? Did he react in any way? Was there a fear that they would turn violent? Mm -hmm. He was very concerned. Um, he was not afraid to meet with uh, groups that would meet with him. For example, BUS, which is Black United Students, um, who had a, a very articulate uh, leader. Uh, at that time, Afro-Ams were very popular as an expression, and um, he came into the office to, uh, I'm going to say request, but to insist upon a meeting with the president, and that he would bring about six people, all male. The black females were not visibly present in the sense of being very vocal about that. They would, as sisters, right. a lot of brother-sister references in those days, um, they were supportive in the sense of coming to meetings and, and those kinds of things, but not out in the front. Not would you describe these groups as more militant, black power? Or yes, more, okay. yes, yes, black and, power. Uh, was there a Muslim? Uh, no. No reference to Muslim okay. at that time. And so we had the meeting, and uh, right next to the president's office, uh, separated by a hallway, was the Board of Trustees meeting room. And he and I met with the six uh, black students. The, um, that one person in particular was the spokesperson, and he had a, a one of those metal combs that had a number of prongs that they used to um, uh, prompt their hair, and and after, and that was right in the center, sticking up. And after a while, he pulled that out. The environment was tense because they had laid uh, some demands: a uh, number of faculty, staff, more financial aid, uh, more recognition for student support, st student group support. In other words, the, the student government that had some money to help fund but resisted funding them. I, I think they, they were willing certainly to fund the Black Student Association, but when it came to the Black Student Union, which is a, a much stronger, more stringent, um, uh, demanding group, and he'd pull that out and he would sit there and make those demands and then he'd kind of flip that onto the table. And it could have been an instrument Mm -hmm. I mean, it was not a piece of plastic, but, but metal. Mm -hmm. Never made any threats. The implications were sufficient. <laughs> uh, and he had um, 
an ability to penetrate you with a stare. I, I, it was really amazing. I mean, he could look at you and you just felt those eyes going right through your head. Mm. Uh, and a very, very serious, no-nonsense dialogue. Hmm. But it lasted probably an hour. The president was receptive to hearing them and some things he said, we will work sincerely in trying to do that. Uh, but he also was one who said, I'm sorry, but that cannot happen. Uh, and being fair and equitable to the population or uh, that would have dramatic repercussion for the institution from the legislature and we would be concerned about funding, which would make it even more difficult for us to accommodate what you're asking us to do. Mm -hmm. um, he was a, a, a very um, serious person, didn't laugh a lot, didn't smile a lot. In fact, he had, a, 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 his hair was such that when, when, when he was nervous or in deep thought, he would sit there and, and play with this uh, block of hair like this. And he did that a lot. This is the president you're the talking president about. president in that meeting. Very bright man, very sincere. Um, I think had deep feelings acknowledging that, yes, the uh, civil rights movement had legitimacy. There was value to that. We will really work hard to receive uh, black students, many of them first generation, most of them first generation. Hmm. Um, and uh, he did hire staff in, in the student affairs area, in the counseling center, in financial aid. Um, and so over time he delivered with those. It was rarely sufficient because mm. demands normally led, well that's not enough, we need more than that kind of, of thing. Which is not uncommon for union type behavior or other people who really have some very strong feelings about um, this meeting, I mean, you're describing a quite tense atmosphere, but it seems like there's an underlying attempt, at a, legit, a legitimate attempt to go to the president and have these demands. Would you describe it as a, a sincere attempt at legitimate uh, policy change rather than a radical type yes, of... Yes, I, I would say it was a legitimate... For the most part, it was a legitimate request. I think what they were saying was um, well-meaning, uh, expressed perhaps in a, in a much stronger um, language than, than necessary, hmm. um, some profanity, knowing that that was upsetting. Um, and the Vice President for Academic Affairs, uh, a very tall, lanky, uh, compassionate man, I think was also very uh, sincere in responding to them and saying that part of our difficulty is um, having a sufficient pool of qualified applicants and during those days it was because uh, the, the pool of, of black uh, professionally trained PhD level people were in high demand at many institutions. Mm -hmm. And, and I think the Berkeleys and, and other Wisconsin and others uh, had first dibs, okay. um, primarily because of, of their reputation, um, their stature. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and if you were good enough to do that, it made it difficult. So let's uh, take it from the Cambodian incursion the Nixon administration's mm -hmm. decision to go into Cambodia and the impact it had on the student body, or this rather radical minority of the student body. Yeah. I, I think that th there was that small radical group. There was then a, a, a group, as you might imagine, predominantly young men, virtually all young men, to say that if this war escalates, um, I could easily be drafted. Mm and required to leave what I'm wanting to do and to serve uh, a, an event, uh, an activity with which I disagree. Mm -hmm. And so um, I, I think the small radical group that year, 
continued to strongly resist the United States dialogue discussion about escalating the war. Mm -hmm. Various politicians were saying that, that we need, just like now, <laughs> we, we need to be firm and take action and, and not um, allow these activities to happen, even though it's in a foreign land. There were a much larger number that, that would suggest it allow diplomacy to occur. When Nixon announced in uh, late April, the, in early May, the bombing of Haiphong Harbor. Well, he set up, a, a, some, as I understand it, uh, there were a number of battleships that, that blockaded that, and mm -hmm. then there was the bombing right. of Haiphong Harbor. And, and that incident provided, I'm going to say, evidence or justification for that radical group, not only at Kent State, but across the country, mm -hmm. the ammunition, the verbal ammunition, right. to say, um, we knew they were lying to us, and, and we are going to now do the only thing that we know to get their attention. And a little context for listeners who might not be aware, Nixon had promised the de-escalation of the war, correct? That's right. So this is That's right. right. It's a dramatic shift, and, and what I think they and some sympathizers said, he's been lying to us. Mm -hmm. And so it just destroyed any trust or any credibility. I'm going to back up a little bit, because in, in the 68, 69 uh, era, there, there were a group of motorcycle people, the, the leather vest and chains and loud motorcycles, that periodically would come into Kent to taunt students. Hmm. I, I'm not sure what prompted that other than their ego and machoism and saying, yeah, you're a bunch of wimps, you're, you know, you're here at college, you've got really a good life, you really don't know what it is to to um, be poor or, or the working class. Even so though there was that class antagonism. Well, yes. it wasn't even class because they came from the same class, yeah. but there was an antagonism yeah. already. Yeah. Interesting. Yes. yes. Okay. So they came in and some of them had these small chains that they would whirl and, and just to threaten and, mm -hmm. and, and make passes at women, which would annoy the guys. There, was a, uh, there were a lot of bars uh, at uh, the north end of Main Street in Kent and so there was a fairly large collection every Friday and Saturday night. There's in many college towns. And, and so they would come roaring down there, and of course, after um, how many beers, the guys would, would puff up their chest and, and make comments to them, and that just antagonized people. Well, mm -hmm. that, that Friday night, which would have been May 1st, May 1st um, was particularly contentious. And, and they got into a fight, um, and, and I, I'm not sure why it, it came to the point where they started setting some dumpsters on fire, mm -hmm. and, and that led to throwing some rocks and breaking windows, one of which was the bank that was on the corner of that intersection, and that set off the alarm, which brought the police, brought out a mayor who had just been elected in March, um, a, an engineer by training, a very quiet, introverted man. Uh, to this day, I'm not sure how he got elected mayor. <laughs> but anyhow, he did. And, and so there was an enormous concern, as you might imagine, to the point where the mayor said, uh, we will not tolerate, we cannot tolerate this kind of behavior. That was on a Friday night. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so he called the governor to bring in the National Guard. Now, the National Guard had been in Akron, 15 miles to the west, for two, three weeks in a very difficult strike where they were there because the trucks were either blockaded, they were hiring, hauling tires out or material in, um, and, and so they cleared that and escorted um, big, caravans of trucks. Now, was this labor or was this anti-war? Uh, labor. Labor, okay. Labor. And, and there was some shooting um, at trucks by sniper. 
And so it was a, it was a difficult time for the, the guard. But the guard was very convenient. The strike was winding down. Mm -hmm. So the governor, who was running for the United States Senate from Ohio against a man by the name of Taft. Well, Taft is a historical political name in, in federal government. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, the governor um, responded to the mayor who called on Saturday as a result of the Friday night incident mm -hmm. <clears throat> and said, you need to send the guard. Um, that, uh, and I'm, I'm not sure of my memory here, whether it was Friday night or Saturday night, um, that the small <coughs> group that expressed great anger at what was happening committed to burning the RTC building. Okay, I think that was Friday night. Yeah, on, on the Kent campus. Right. And I, I think perhaps because of the distraction of, of the law enforcement downtown, they came onto the campus. And the, the campus was, it was called the Commons. <clears throat> and that was a huge open area that separated most of the academic buildings from the residence hall. Hmm. And, and it was used as an ROTC training ground. Uh, it also served as flag football for intramurals, frisbee playing. It was just a, a, a big open area that was accessible to anybody and everybody to do just about whatever you wanted. Mm -hmm. Dogs running around, all this stuff. <clears throat> The RTC building was at, at the end of that commons, an old wooden structure. They broke the windows with glass bottles and had rags with gasoline trying to lob those into that building. They were successful at doing that. Fire engine responded, fire department, <clears throat> hooked up the hose, but they were prepared to cut those hoses with knives, which had to be pretty major instruments, weapons, mm. to cut through a fire hose. And right. <laughs> pretty heavy stuff. But they did that. The, and the fire department, not being able to put out the fire, left. Mm -hmm. And, and um, of course, there was ammunition and in addition to weapons. And so that started going off from the fire, which created a real concern. There weren't a lot of people there at the time. It was just a group that was attempting to do that. Mm. Police, once it started firing uh, ammunition, they backed off as well, understandably. Yeah. But there weren't a lot of them there because of what was happening downtown. Okay. <clears throat> so anyhow, on Saturday, the, the, the mayor made the request to the governor, send in the, the guard, which he did. They came marching over with a caravan of equipment, um, uh, personnel carriers, um, some small weaponry. Uh, and everybody had a rifle with a bayonet. <clears throat> the president left Friday during the day to go to Iowa City, Iowa, because he was a member of the ACT Board of Directors. Mm -hmm. ACT being, SAT and ACT are major testing instruments that determine qualifications to get into most universities, mm -hmm. much more so then than now. <clears throat> We debated that, whether he should go. Just There was just a sense of unrest. Mm -hmm. But everybody kind of agreed and saying, yeah, you've got a responsibility and, and you probably ought to go. We're, we're okay. <clears throat> In hindsight, one of the, I think, uh, bad decisions or poor decisions was that the policy for the campus when the president was absent. There would usually be a second in command. Mm -hmm. Not uncommon that that would be the vice president for academic affairs or a person who occupies the title of provost, mm -hmm. meaning second mm -hmm. in authority. Uh, but Robert I. White said, <clears throat> if it's a faculty issue, the provost and the vice president for academic affairs would be the officer in charge. If it is a student generated issue, it's gonna be the vice president for student affairs. If it's a, a maintenance, custodial, um, heating problem, flooding problem from a broken pipe or whatever, a police issue, it's going to be the vice president for business and finance. Mm -hmm. 
And we had a vice president for um, administration and public relations, which did a lot of work with alumni, uh, the business community in raising funds, relationship with the legislature. My friend, my mentor, right. was that person. So there was a, a bit of confusion on Saturday about who was really going to take command. Right. She had four different people, but it wasn't clear that that fell in any one given category. It really wasn't a faculty issue, although there were several faculty that, that were expressing grave concern. It wasn't some of the, the, the young people involved were not students. Howie Emmer, who was really, I think, the, the leader, <coughs> had been a student, but had withdrawn to devote full time and energy to this small core. He was the spokesman. He was the person with the energy, the aggressiveness, <clears throat> very articulate. Who in the administration would respond on Saturday? Yes. And, and each one had their own respective area of responsibility. I, I think <laughs> it quickly became apparent that the Vice President for Student Affairs and the Dean of Students and their staff, uh, Campus Life staff, Residence Hall staff, we're, we're going to have the greatest impact in interacting with students, mm -hmm. many of whom had left for the weekend. Right. Um, so uh, we put the call in immediately to the president once the decision was made for the guard to come in. And the guard moved in with enormous force. They had personnel carriers, they pulled up, there was a huge sweeping um, circular driveway in front of the administration building, kind of like a rainbow. They pulled up there with one of these huge communication trucks, pulled out those cables, uh, broke the glass of the front door to gain entry. The president's office was in immediately to the right, and next to that was that conference room mm -hmm. to which I made reference. They posted an armed guard, military policeman, with a bayoneted rifle in front of that door, and that's where the commandant made his headquarters. Mm -hmm. um, and then there were guard people dispersed all over the campus including uh, tank kinds of, not huge tanks, but smaller military vehicles posted at various locations of entry. There were a lot of entry. I mean, there was no fence around the, the campus at that point. Um, and it was um, to, uh, the administration building had a large front lawn that went out to the major public highway. Uh, it was a state highway and then a major uh, thoroughfare um, adjacent to the campus and and no campus property on either side of those two streets and and so uh, the president had difficulty in getting a flight back Iowa City is not the largest town in the world and didn't have uh, airlines that were operating um, during the weekend so we eventually made the decision to send the university plane to Iowa City to pick him up mm -hmm. bring him back and he didn't get back until Sunday. Um, Saturday uh, was um, a game playing with students um, that were there, uh, and Sunday the students started coming back, um, and so they were shocked. Of course the news media was carrying that, but really didn't understand what the guard was attempting to do, and so they started playing games. A lot of construction on the campus so that there were broken pieces of brick and block. Uh, girls would pick flowers and, and put them, particularly the group that would be identified as a hippie type group, mm -hmm. um, and they would put flowers down the gun barrels of, of the soldiers in the National Guard. A lot of these National Guards were young people, a number of them were students you know, at Kent State. Hmm. Uh, it had to be a very difficult time. Uh, I mean, it was to do their job at, at a strike at a fire company with labor, not a, so much of a problem, but here are peers, right. colleagues, friends right. that, that I know, and now they had to play a completely different role and maintain order. Right. Um, and no, I don't think there was anybody that had the foggiest notion that those weapons were loaded. Right. Bayonets you could see. Um, the president returned and we worked very hard to convince the commandant to, to leave, to pull back. 
he, he had a, a very, I don't know what you call them, battalion units. Anyhow, there were groups that were bivouacked out at the football stadium, which was a couple miles from the campus in, in a, an area not heavily populated with houses or anything. An error was made in, in one group being transferred out and another one coming in. I don't know how the orders got confused, but the group that went in was ordered back onto the campus. Um, but, but students were running around, they started blocking this highway, and so a bayoneted garrison uh, of, of soldiers would form a, a V formation and sweep that highway and, and move the students, and, and as soon as they came close, they didn't want to be the recipient of a bayonet, um, they would move, they would run, and so they'd go to another street. And so there was these battalion or units of, of military people that were around before long, these helicopters, maybe three or four of them with these huge searchlights uh, appeared in the air and so there was enormous noise over the community which created concern on the part of citizens that were unaffiliated uh, with the university but lived nearby and so they were sweeping uh, the grounds to find student groups and of course there were other people that were attempting to arrest students that were doing all of this. Finally calmed down, they went back to their residence halls or where they were living and, and the next morning on Monday of May 4, there was this whisper campaign around the campus, meet on the commons at noon. Don't know who started that, probably that small element, shrewd they, would, they could start something and then disappear and allow that group that becomes, or that the, the element that becomes a part of a group and group behavior takes over. Mm -hmm. Kind of like the old days, somebody would suggest a panty raid. It didn't take long for a lot of guys to gather around the residence hall. Mm -hmm. And all it took is a suggestion of somebody to do something like, go ahead, Charlie, break the window, get in there. Mm -hmm. and, and, and they would do stuff that they ordinarily wouldn't do. Sort of a mob mentality. Yeah, that, that's right. And so a lot of people at noon, now remember this is in the center of the campus and residence halls are on one side and academic buildings. It's a major pathway to and from class to eating at the residence hall and going back to class. And so there are a lot of people interacting, but there's also now because of this, what's gonna happen at noon on the commons? There's a lot of people, probably several thousand, that gather around the periphery with these armed, uh, highly disciplined National Guardsmen in units. And the new architecture building, relatively new, columned a lot of glass, sat on the, the highest point of the campus. And adjacent to that were several residence halls. And uh, students were milling around, of course, and, and this garrison of troops had been on the other side of that architecture building, had marched down this fairly lengthy sloping hill, and found themselves, I think, surprised in the corner of a cyclone fence that had been constructed for some of the construction, mm -hmm. and could very easily be uh, cornered. And they very quickly turned around when they recognized that and, and marched pretty rapidly back up that hill. They got to the top of the hill. There was a little pagoda. And they got to that top of that hill and in a line, they turned around and lifted their rifles and fired. Now, there's all kind of theories. Some people said they heard a shot from some other weapon. Some people say they spotted uh, a person on top of a residence hall with a rifle. I think eventually it turned out that it was several people on top of the residence hall roof, which is close by, with cameras mm -hmm. photographing the stuff. When it really turned out, the guards said they were threatened by the crowd, but the filming showed that there wasn't a student within a hundred yards of any guardsman. So it very quickly dispelled that it could have been that the guard was threatened. When they fired, they killed four people, many of them at considerable distance. One had been, or well, several, in a parking lot. You remember, if you've seen the film, the, the girl 
from another place who was uh, wailing over the body, um, people trying to hide behind vehicles. One of them shot was an honor, honor ROTC student, the best anybody could tell, walking from his meal to his class. One of the injured was the son of the President of the Alumni Association. <laughs> as fine a young man as you can imagine, wasn't involved in any part of any of the issues before. Um, and there was, the other two were innocent bypassers. Mm -hmm. One girl that was killed may have been identified as um, part of that, not the hardcore, but an active element. But again, um, out there with either a sign or yelling or screaming or holding up paper, and could have easily just been a random shot in the, because I don't think they could see and identify her as guardsman. Uh, they didn't know Allison Krauss personally, right. so I don't, I don't think any of that unit would have said, ah, there, there's one, and, and took aim at her. It just one of those happen chance. Right. Uh, there were then nine injured, one of them paralyzed, and, and still is a spokesman. Uh, travels around the country on occasion to uh, talk about that experience, um, paraplegic. Well, um, that morning, continuation of trying to convince the Commandant to pull back, that there was not a conspiracy, there were not a group of terrorists, um, leave, because you are the one that are causing all of this tension and concern. Faculty were on the commons saying, students, don't stay here, go to class, go back to your residence hall. Not very many of them did that. Um, how did you hear of the shooting? Well, interesting. Um, we had met with the commandant that morning, and the president said, uh, before noon, um, let's grab a bite to eat. So we got in the car several cars, went out to a restaurant, maybe a block from the campus, had just sat down, ordered the meal, and a waitress came and said, you have a call from the campus. I went as the assistant to take that call. And the, the initial call was that um, some of the guardsmen and policemen had been shot, leading us to believe that there was, in fact, a contingent that was going to take that next step of violence. I didn't even get back from the phone to the table to convey that message and a second call from another person came. I turned around, took that call and said, it was not military people who were shot, it's the National Guard that have shot students and we think some are dead. Well, I went back and we, everybody immediately got up, food hadn't even been delivered, got up and we just exited that restaurant, got into cars, immediately went back to campus. Of course, it was just absolute pandemonium. The Dean of Students was on the campus, as was the residence hall staff, trying very hard to say, disperse, uh, not knowing what the guard might do in addition to that. Some faculty member, including the chairman of the faculty council, a man by the name of Glenn Frank, a wonderful, absolutely wonderful person um, who was sincerely concerned about what was going to happen and the welfare of certainly the students in the campus at large, running madly around, screaming at students, you've got to leave before more people are killed. And, and some of the faculty that were there, whether they were supportive or not, he pleaded to them, they participated in saying, You've got to leave. Leave the campus. Go wherever you can go, but leave the campus. All right. Many of them did. Uh, the student affairs people, residence hall people, very quickly started conveying, you need to leave town. Go by whatever means. You've got a car, go home. Go to a friend's house, but leave Kent. Uh, some of them took a bus. Um, some of them hitchhiked. Some of them grabbed rides with others. International students really had no place to go, so we created a hall, identified a hall to which they could 
congregate and, and be cared for by staff and meals and beds. Um, the guard stayed. Uh, of course, it was a very, very somber environment. Was there a fear of retaliation on behalf of the students for the shooting? Did the, did the faculty fear that the students would continue to provoke further violence? That really didn't become a public issue. There may have been uh, about that, but that, that radical group very quickly hibernated, mm -hmm. left the scene. James Michener, the author who wrote a book, Kent State, would contend that they used a, an abandoned, what he called um, the haunted house, this big old mansion that had been vacant for a number of years, and students periodically would go up there and mess around or romantic tryst or whatever, and, and contended that, that the group hid there. Uh, they were not to be found um, and couldn't really be tied to the incident. It was a guard-created incident. Well, on Sunday, the governor, James Rhodes, flew in in the governor's plane to the airport and made this pronouncement that we will not tolerate this terrorist behavior on the part of this small group which is trying, claim to be communist and are trying to bring down the government and we will use whatever force is necessary, including weapons, guns, which empowered, obviously, the, at least the officers of the Guard. Here's the governor who oversees and has administrative authority over the Guard, uh, making these statements, get in his plane, gets in his plane and goes back to Columbus. So at that point, how how did you feel the likelihood of a violent confrontation would be? I had no idea that that would happen. And what were your impressions upon your initial hearing the news? Can you, how did the president respond in your uh, experience, in your vicinity? Yeah. The president, once he got back on the campus, was very concerned for two reasons. One, the Ohio Highway Patrol highly professional, highly trained, had all been commandeered to Columbus, Ohio, the location of Ohio State University. Ohio State University had been experiencing the week prior to that more difficulty than what Kent State had or Kent, Ohio. They were breaking windows, burning cars, and dumping over dumpsters in large numbers. Right. So everybody from the patrol went to Columbus. We had none left in, in Kent. So I think a lot of people, because the commandant took control mm -hmm. and he said, I will determine what's going to happen on this campus. He didn't say that we had to cancel classes, but as far as any authority from the president or any vice presidents or other people, we had very, very little authority to do anything other than to persuade students or faculty to not confront mm -hmm. and certainly not create violence with the guard. Right. Um, the, the commandant chose not to leave and therefore a strategy session at noon to say, how can we convince them to reduce this tension and anxiety and uh, retract their people? Even if they went and bivouacked at the stadium, everybody if they were really concerned to stay in the area in case something was going to happen. You wouldn't even agree to that. So once the shooting occurred and students left, faculty left, um, there were about six of us that, that stayed on the campus with permission of the guard, uh, and we spent the next three nights never leaving the campus for fear of not being able to get back on. In fact, by Tuesday morning, there was an order that only authorized personnel can enter the campus. They very quickly erected a fence all the way around the campus, which provided them control of access. Um, we eventually, once the campus was quiet, the bulk of the guard left, but there was still a small contingent to control entry 
back on the campus. Faculty had to decide, do I give grades, because there are only about two, three weeks of school left. Do I give the grades that have been earned to date? Do I collect papers that were expected as a requirement? Do I give final exams? Some went to Akron, Canton, Youngstown, Cincinnati, Dayton, Cleveland, um, any place they could go where there was a collection of students. And a lot of them did it by phone, saying, you can send the paper to me at such and such an address. Many of them just gave the grade that was earned at that point. The campus was literally closed for the summer. Um, of course, the enormous public relations issue, safety issue, concern on the part of parents, mm -hmm. particularly who had first-time freshmen coming registered there to be admitted in the fall. So everybody worked overtime during the summer to one to try to articulate what in fact happened, what was the primary cause. We didn't have in the city of Kent, a large contingent of terrorists, people that were going to kill other people. And there was never any evidence from that group that, that they instigated that, they admitted to the fire, or that they were going to escalate it to the point of being violent in, in terms of killing people. That never happened. I, I think it shocked not only that community and state, but the nation. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I think the, the nation, including the president, finally acknowledged the, of the country that we cannot resolve our differences by killing our young people. Um, the, the whole strategy of the governor backfired. He got beaten very badly by Taft for the Senate. In my judgment, and I think my colleagues that were close to that, say he's the one that ought to be sitting in prison today, yet. All of the lawsuits that were filed by the, the parents of the students that were killed, the, the students and the parents of those who were injured, faculty members that, that were extremely angered and, and very vocal about that, um, the president, uh, unfortunately the president took the hit. Um, before we get too far into the reactions after the shooting. There was a couple of questions I wanted to ask uh, without backtracking too far. One, um, how prominent was the ROTC on campus, uh, that student body? Yeah, what, very. Very, yeah. okay. So there a lot was, of students were members, they were respected, you know, not a problem. Okay. They wore uniforms to class. And then there wasn't problems yeah. with that, okay. Well, taunted taunted by periodically, but not a big issue, not a, an intentional ongoing kind of thing by that small hardcore, mm -hmm. saying you're part of the establishment. Right. But there was no violent confrontations. No. no. And two, um, the Friday night, the bar fights and that scene in the city, you mentioned the motorcycle groups. Were they involved in those fights in the streets? So. Yeah, there was an entanglement of some fisticuff kind of stuff, and that's what created I, I think the the um, more intense environment of that and and in throwing rocks at each other, they hit some store windows, tavern windows. It's not difficult to hit the bank because it was right there on the corner, bars across the street. Uh, whether that was intentional on the part of somebody to say we're going to create a robbery, I don't think so. Uh, it just was a victim of being close. Were there outside agitators on campus that Monday, to um, your knowledge? Yeah, I, I, it's hard to say whether there was an element that came into Kent that was a part of the transient group that was back and forth from Chicago to New York and stopping along the way and, and, and Kent became a, a convenient, easy to get to place and they knew they had this hardcore group that was persistent and and committed uh, public statements that you know we're communist and we'll do whatever we need to do and if I have to give my life for that so be it I mean that that was the brazen attitude expressed by Howie Emmer and and those people perhaps his lieutenants his people that around mm -hmm. him that helped to manage this uh, effort mm -hmm. yeah what steps did the faculty take 
um, to provide counseling services for these students upon coming back to the university? Considerable. Um, I think Glenn Frank was the focal point of that effort in, in, in calling together faculty to say that um, there's been a, an enormous tragedy and there's a trauma uh, of students new who are now unsure. Uh, is it in fact safe for me to come back? Uh, this element that was continuously uh, agitating, fomenting um, friction and upset and concern. People in the community adjacent to the campus in the summer, you could see people sitting on their porch with a shotgun, not knowing how, how extensive was this. Were there people from other communities, other states that would come in and provide support to this radical group and destroy the city now that there's been this shooting and this anger that, that's been created? A lot of people in the society at large angry with Nixon and, and his contingent about what they were doing. Parents now who had sons that were going to be drafted to fight this war. Uh, there was just an enormous expansion of tension and, and fear, uh, I, I think, in a lot of places. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Um, but the, the, uh, one observation, the, I think that the African American, the black, uh, the, the bus, the, the really hardcore people that were taking on the mayor in Chicago and some places like that, never merged with the Vietnam uh, hippie radical group and joining their cause. It, it remained a civil rights issue for most of them. Interesting. And it seems like if they had, then violence surely would have been further. Yeah, I, I, one can certainly speculate that, that that could have occurred. Inside the community of Kent, was there a reaction against the guard or was there a reaction against the students as far as who's to blame? Um, that's a tough question. I, I, I think obviously a lot of varying positions on right, the continuum. Right. Um, I, I think people, there was an element probably more closely affiliated with the university and faculty and staff families that were angered at the guard and why were they carrying live ammunition uh, other than losing a building there had not been any evidence of shooting. Why did they have to be so rigid and demanding and, and aggressive mm. in, in their reaction to this expression of opinion and collection of people? There are others, like today, who would support some of our politicians that we should have bombed North Korea years ago and we should have gone into Syria. We ought to be taken out uh, the terrorists and most of the Muslim population because they are respond. I mean, it's that attitude, that 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 extremism that has evolved in this society. And I think back then it was an element in the community. The guys that sat on the porch with a shotgun. Right. That that we got a bunch of young people that that uh, don't appreciate what they've got and respect authority and the freedoms. And by golly, they need to be taught a lesson kind of an attitude. And, and, and the rest were just fearful and saying, what's going to happen to our town? Interesting. You know, what, what do we do? So I, I, the majority continued to go to work. Obviously those who were employees of the institution couldn't get to their offices and perform their tasks. Uh, the institution continued to pay them. Mm -hmm. Slowly in the course of the summer, more and more were allowed to come back onto the campus and, and by midsummer I think most were so that they could take care of what hadn't been taken care of and prepare uh, orientation sessions and communication with faculty and staff and uh, enormous publication in papers and media to reassure the larger public that it was okay. Mm -hmm. 
Besides the counseling services, how do you feel that the student body coped with such a, a tragic event the next year? Um, Some of them dropped out. Wow. Transferred. Some of them said, I'm not going to go any place for the fall semester. I'll wait to see what happens. I, I think, and, and I, as I remember, our, our student population is down several thousand. Wow. Um, which is a financial hit, obviously. Absolutely. Um, but most of them came back um, perhaps a bit leery, but willing to say they're not going to chase us away, we're not going to let this defeat us, and, and, and came back. I think it was a more somber mood, mm -hmm. uh, but, but student activities, professional staff and, and student organizations that worked overtime to engage students in constructive and positive kind of behavior, um, a willingness on the part of virtually anybody to talk about that and allow the expression of feelings. Mm -hmm. um, Do you feel that um, some of the students who were initially ambivalent toward the war um, do you feel that it pushed them toward more radicalism or more? If it did, it was more in um, their own thought process as opposed to physical expression of that. Uh, if anything, we saw a diminishment of physical activity against the war. I think even the radical group uh, were probably shocked at what transpired and drew a line and saying, we're not going to continue to try to escalate this feeling. So I, I, there was not a visible increase in demonstrations or sit-ins of classrooms uh, perhaps a lot more discussion in classes mm -hmm. where one would normally not expect that to be an issue. I'm sure it was heavy in sociology and political science, perhaps psychology, mm -hmm. uh, but not so much in other unrelated um, discipline. Absolutely. Um, so while researching Vietnam, I was I found myself surprised. I feel that a lot of my generation would be surprised at the public reactions against the students at Kent. And I found myself drawing parallels between the public support of the National Guard and the public support of Lieutenant Cowley at the My Lai incident. And these are surely considered atrocities. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, the reasons that for support of American atrocity during this era? Excuse me if that question isn't focused no, enough. No, um, there's an element, probably always has been, in smaller and larger numbers in our society, <clears throat> depending on national or international circumstances, that take a, a fairly harsh attitude about um, dictators and authoritarian personalities in foreign countries who are repressive, oppressive, um, committing a lot of fraud, um, taking a lot of the funds that are intended from developed countries to recreate or reestablish society there, rebuild it like they did in Germany that a lot of that money never reaches there because um, the upper level uh, takes so much of that for their own and discover subsequently they got millions if not billions in some foreign account. Um, there's the other end that says that we should not be involved in trying to tell other countries what to do and so quick to intervene militarily and with force that believes that industry and big business are the ones that support, particularly quietly and behind the scenes, and manipulate government uh, because of their wealth and their power and their influence. Mm -hmm. 
um, and that middle group that says, you know, we shouldn't be doing that, but who am I to determine? I don't have access to the material. Mm -hmm. if, if somebody is killing a lot of people, like in Cambodia, who, who comes to the defense of these helpless people that were part of the killing fields? Mm -hmm. uh, and so there's, there becomes a moral debate about what is our role? Um, what are the ethics? Um, and that's shifted from time to time. I, I you know, I, I think a lot of people created a distrust, which was confirmed with, with Watergate about the whole Nixon administration and, and the people that he had around them um, that were falsifying information, manipulating things, paying enormous sums of money to um, keep ammunition and expand the military uh, organization. It wasn't until Eisenhower came in and, and as the general, uh, highly regarded perhaps as one of the greatest generals in the minds of a lot of people, maybe second to MacArthur, but there again, there are a lot, a lot of different <laughs> attitudes about MacArthur and right. saying Truman was right in canning him. Other ones said had he been able to march on China, we wouldn't have all this stuff. Well. Um, so I, I think it changed a lot when 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 Eisenhower came in. Uh, another major effort I, I think changed the attitude was when Carter came in with a different attitude. And until the hostages, right, and and that pretty well did him in because it was uh, foiled, which could have happened with Bin Laden <laughs> and, and Obama. I mean, the same kind of thing. You got a secret uh, high-powered team going in trying to rescue, of course. There were hundreds of hostages versus the focus of one person, and and so that shifts, you know, back and forth. Um, um, you mentioned the the notion of American morality. What did the Kent State massacre? How did it affect the international view of American society and that idea of American morality? Do you feel? How did it shape that view? I, I think for the larger number of Americans, it said we, we went too far. Mm. Our, our policies and our practices allowed a, a violent act by our own government against our own people, and we cannot do that. Um, I think society in general became more tolerant of demonstrations um, and, and we increased security, increased police forces. Uh, that led, in some cases, to overreaction and violent behavior by policemen, profiling um, elements of our society, which is still an accusation today, particularly against black and now more Hispanic Mexicans. Spanish um, and Muslim, Absolutely. Um, not quite so evident in um, observable things against Muslim as opposed to a lot of, uh, of verbal comments. I'd like to follow up on this idea of profiling certain groups. Do you feel that the student movement, the alleged hippies or the student mm -hmm. demonstrators, do you feel like media perhaps demonized that portion of society? Not exactly dehumanized, but rather labeled them and profiled them as what was wrong with American society mm -hmm. at the time? What are your thoughts on that? Um, I struggle with that concept today, as, as a matter of fact, and, and always have. Uh, I think there are elements of the media that really work hard to convey what they honestly believe is happening, transpiring. Mm. Now you can go to various elements of any cause or movement and find that really hardcore um, extremist mm -hmm. to those people who have some empathy, really don't want to be a part of it, but say, well, I understand why they would do that. Uh -huh. And, and so, depending on 
the reporter, the media, or the people that determine what our focus is going to be, Fox vis-a-vis MSNBC or NBC or CCN or CNN, kind of a, a, a range. Um, I I have trouble believing that there is a media conspiracy that is trying to persuade society at large. To me, the value and the really very critical principle is the freedom of the press and freedom of speech. And, and campuses had really, really struggled with that in that era. Not so much today, although there are some campuses that have been challenged, uh, but I think there is a much greater tolerance for expression and openness and transparency today on most campuses. It, it would be more a religious-based institution that, that perhaps expresses a stronger feeling or attitude about you shouldn't be allowed to do that. Um, it's kind of like a long time where Oral Roberts said girls couldn't wear anything but a skirt. Um, you can't dance, um, you can't smoke. I mean, really a, a very clear, defined set of parameters if you want to be a part of this institution. Well, maybe there's a legitimate place for that. You know what the expectations are. And if you can't abide by those, why go? Right. But there are people that go and saying, well, you know, it's gone too far and, and we need to um, liberalize this. So I, I, I don't, I think the freedom of expression and the freedom of press, the access to information, which the press has to fight for all the time, including in this state, particularly in this state, <laughs> uh, about uh, what what elements of communication by the governor is is open open meeting rules regulations. Fortunately, there are some people that are willing to go to court mm -hmm. and saying, you know, there's there's a person in Oklahoma City whose name I don't know, but is frequently saying, uh, legislature went too far. Mm -hmm. We're going to sue you, and and they, and they've they've won. So I, I don't know, Jason. It's um, it's a fine balance, uh, and it seems to tip pretty far one way, and then all of a sudden they're shootings and saying, "Wait a minute, we can't do that." Mm -hmm. So it starts to come back, and there's an element that says, "Whoa, wait a minute, we've gone too far." Current issues: abortion, immigration, right. etc. School and, shootings. Huh? School shootings today. The what? The school shootings today. Oh, yes, absolutely, absolutely. And and the open gun law now and, and the insistence on one part that everybody ought to have a gun mm -hmm. and other people say that nobody except trained law enforcement military ought to have weapons and everything in between. But I, I think it's the, in my opinion, the openness of the press and the adherence to those fundamental principles are, are, are really critical, and, and we're, we're struggling with some. The, the whole issue of religion. Absolutely. Um, the Hobby Lobby, uh, the issue of can a company be a person? Um, and you know, that's not a dead issue by a long shot. Right? And fortunately, there are enough people, United States citizens, and even some that are not citizens, who believe strongly, that's why they come here because there's been a repression in their own country and they're not allowed to say those things or do those things. Um, well, um, you know, today as a student, it seems unimaginable that the military would come on campus and yeah. fire upon students. Was it as unimaginable then yeah. as it is now? Yeah. yeah, shocking, absolutely shocking. One, that they would even think about having loaded weapons, maybe an ammunition belt, but not a loaded weapon. That would at least have required somebody to give an order to load your weapons, and it couldn't have been an immediate reaction. But I think even then people were shocked that, that, that one would have had ammunition on their being, maybe close by, 
And after all, they're, they're, if you run into a threatening situation, it's like a policeman. At former campuses, there has been enormous debate as to whether campus police officers trained as law enforcement people should even carry a weapon. Mm -hmm. Well, ride with a policeman sometime. <laughs> it's not a pleasant experience uh, under certain circumstances because you don't really know what the person who's committing uh, a, an abusive situation or violent thing or destruction of property or robbing somebody mm -hmm is going to do. Um, the whole mental health issue today, on the one hand, there's a reluctance to make a judgment quickly. On the other hand, there's some evidence that would suggest there's been all kinds of advanced behavioral exhibits right. that should have forewarned somebody that this person was going to do that. Of course, that's hindsight. That's hindsight. That's right. Right. So, you know, to how quickly do you intervene, and and if so, how far and to what extent? You know, they used to lock up anybody that that appeared to have any kind of a mental problem. We had mental institutions all over the country. Absolutely. We we shocked electric shock people who were thought to have strange different attitudes, and 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 fortunately we've overcome that. But we still struggle. Um, do you feel that society has evolved today past the possibility of a reoccurrence of that? Another way of asking that yeah. is how likely do you think that a situation such, such a tragic situation could happen again in American society? I'd like to believe that we've overcome that, but I'm not 100% sure. I, I think there is an element in this society expressed not long ago by the guy in Wyoming mm -hmm. who brought a, an armed contingent to confront um, a federal group right. that were merely attempting to enforce the law. Mm -hmm. and, and, that, and I need to be careful about generalizing, but the, the skinhead, um, I'm not even sure what nationalists are these people that will encamp themselves in a forest or a, a, a enclosed community mm -hmm. and, and have enormous sources of ammunition and weapons. Uh, the, the Texas, um, that religious cult, mm -hmm. um, and I think a lot of people, general people in the public said they're, they're, that, that was an overreaction. <laughs> And, and moving in there with tanks and, and all this kind of stuff, that there could have been some ne negotiations and uh, a better way to resolve the killing of what a lot of people claim were innocent. So I, I, I think, unfortunately, there are still pockets uh, in this country that, that cause in law enforcement um, to say we, we need to be on guard and, and we need to use force if, if that becomes necessary. Uh, the Southern Poverty Law Center, mm -hmm. um, I, I think, uh, exposes a, a large number of, of people in virtually every state mm -hmm. that, that have attitudes against anybody other than the pure white Caucasian, um, immigrants, that's fast heading to, uh, you know, they're now saying we're going to send the National Guard down there. Um, how quickly do they fire on people? And, and, and some of it's drug cartel taking advantage of moving stuff across. Some of it is the other end are people that are trying to avoid being murdered Absolutely. Uh, in their own country or, or starving. People in this country, in my opinion, who think they know because of things they've read, things they've heard, have watched films, understand, <coughs> understand the environment of, of other countries. I've long contended as a result of my own experience that <clears throat> until you go there, you smell it, you see it, you touch it, and you step in it, you don't understand it. Absolutely. 
Um, there, there are too many people in my judgment that think everybody that's unemployed are a bunch of lazy folks. And they lay a lot of that on the black community. Absolutely. For some strange reason, we're unwilling to talk about what is the cause. Well, for me individually, um, whenever I read a, about a, an event such as the Kent State Massacre, um, there's an element that seems incomprehensible even. And to speak with you almost seems surreal to me. What would you tell my generation to help them understand the situation and the depth of that tragedy? Mm -hmm. I, I, I guess my first comment to this generation would, would be to be informed with factual information. I, I think our, our current focus on the technology evolution is creating problems and real concern because there's a large element that tends to believe everything they read. Mm -hmm. And anybody can say anything through all of these mechanisms. So how, how, how do you convince people to seek out the truth or as much factual information as possible first. Mm -hmm. And the ones I, well, I, I was going to say the ones I worry about are the, the least educated and that's not always true, although it's a, it's a large element um, reflected in this state in my opinion. Um, so I, I would say learn as much factual information as you can and express your strong feelings, your beliefs, mm -hmm. and don't don't be reluctant to do that. Be respectful. Um, be thoughtful. Be as um, articulate as you can be. Um, align yourself with other people who appear to be rational, reasonable fairly moderate people mm -hmm. understand that it would be easy to implement things that you think should be done if you had a dictator. <laughs> <laughs> but also think about all the other stuff that comes along with that. Mm -hmm. How many times have you and others heard that democracy is messy? It's contentious. There's always this friction and people saying, you don't know what you're talking about, or this ought to be done, and you need to vote for me, and you vote for me for this, and I'll vote for you for that kind of stuff. But it's second to none mm -hmm. in the life of mankind at this point. Right. I, I think our current problem is we, we don't have any more, we don't have very many diplomats mm -hmm. that people are willing to sit down in a reasonable, rational way and saying, let's, let's solve this problem, there's got to be an answer. You're not always going to get your way, and I'm not always going to get mine. And we know that we can't veer to one extreme or the other and accommodate the majority of people. Um, it seems to me that you've, I don't know if it's been the process over 40 years, but you take a moderate stance. Yeah. And, and it seems that you were very outspoken against a fanatic group, which uh, there's a lot of good reason behind that. Sure. Right? Um, how did you react after Kent as far as your political beliefs and as far as um, your personal beliefs about uh, political dissent and uh, freedom of speech? How did you react personally? I, I think it's fair for me to say that I, I championed the right for the freedom of expression in my jobs. Example. Two examples. Oklahoma State, um, three examples. <laughs> the so-called minister that comes to the campus. Mm -hmm. Somebody out of Arkansas, Missouri comes here and starts preaching out on the library lawn and, and makes accusation that if you're a member of a sorority or wearing a short skirt, you're a whore. Mm -hmm. And if you're a member of a fraternity, 
you, you commit sin all the time because of your drinking and your carousing and your um, having sexual relationships with with uh, women. Um, there was a an effort on the part of a group of students that were members of these religious centers around the campus. Mm -hmm. Very moderate, rational, reasonable people who believed deeply in what they were doing. So they got together in the spring semester and said, what can we do to bring uh, attention to the larger group of new students to at least be aware of what we stand for? So they decided to show a movie at, in the first week of school called The Last Temptation of Christ. And in the meantime, Oklahoma State University selected a new president who came on board mid-July, mm -hmm. early July, somewhere in July. <clears throat> and this was supposed to occur in mid-August. And so they started publicity before the freshmen started to arrive. There were a group of people in Oklahoma City that started to call the president and saying, you can't let them show that film on the campus. It's blasphemous. So the president, relative, well, really knew, um, came to me as vice president for student affairs and says, Bill, we, we, we're not going to be able to show that movie. And I picked my jaw up off the floor. I said, um, we've got a policy that deals with these things that brings together faculty, students, staff, ministers, attorneys, and parents. Whenever there is an issue, be it a speaker, printed material, or a film, or musical group that would be judged um, to be um, controversial, we'll call the group together and we'll add all the facts and the information to make a decision, and that's what we'll rule. So I said, I'll pull, I'll pull this group together. So we watched the film three times, and nobody ever suggested that that was her, uh, heresy. Mm -hmm. So I said, I, I don't think we can do that, Mr. President. He said, yeah, we're not going to show that film there on the campus. So trying to be a good supporter of, of, of uh, the president, knowing that he had the ultimate authority next to the Board of Regents, trustees, I went to a, a church and made arrangements to show the film at the church. They agreed. So I went to the president's office thinking, we've resolved this issue. I said, the church has agreed, the kids have agreed, we're going to show the film off the campus. He said, you don't listen very well, do you? I was shocked. I said, what do you mean? He said, we're not going to show that film in this town. And I said, sir, with all due respect, you can't do that. He says, yeah, we're not going to show the film. We're the ones that ordered the film, and we're not going to show the film. I said, tomorrow, when you announce that, if that's your position, tomorrow morning, the green in front of the library and next to your office will be filled with faculty and students, and they will take you to court, Mr. President. Well, he blew me off. Next morning, the line was full of students and faculty who took him to court, federal court. At which time the judge said, Mr. President, you're not even in the ballpark. Get back and let them see the film. Of course, at that point, everybody in the world wanted to see the film. There wouldn't have been a hundred students <laughs> going to see that film. All right, we're picking back up, and you were going to give me another incident of how... Uh... Yeah, uh, Dr. Ruth Westheimer, uh, a Jewish lady, a nationally known sexologist, and, and the um, Student Activities Board wanted to bring her here to have an open dialogue, uh, believing that most people shy away from that subject, which is pretty much a traditional habit in this country of not talking openly about sex, mm -hmm. a Puritan uh, influence from our early history. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, she was contracted to come. A similar, if not the same group, called me and objected to her coming. And if she comes and talks openly about this, we'll have nothing but a bunch of brothels in the residence halls after that. So I, I chat with him periodically, and I finally said, gentlemen, have you read her book? 
No, I don't need to read her book. I know enough about her. I said, well, if you read her book, you would understand that her very first recommendation to anybody that comes to her about what kind of a relationship they ought to have with the opposite sex is one, to talk about it with their parents. And the second one would be with a minister, a priest, or a rabbi. Mm -hmm. um, now, that's just a bunch of liberal talk. I finally said, oh, then they said, how much money would it take to send to her to keep her from coming? Just don't even have her come to the table. We'll just send the money, whatever it is. It can be more than the price that she's asked. My response to that was that she's not for sale. We don't want your 30 pieces of silver. Mm -hmm. And I hung up. Um, she came. There was a person running for governor that came to my office and said, you need to know that I'm going to distribute literature the week prior to her coming here and I will invoke a citizen's arrest if she uses certain language that's unacceptable to be spoken publicly. I, I forget what his name was. I said, George, you can hand out literature wherever you want as long as you don't block traffic and interfere with classroom instruction. Mm -hmm. And you can talk to anybody on the campus that will stop to listen to you. But if you attempt to interfere with this woman making a speech, I will have you arrested. Understood? Well, he stormed out of there. I'm running for governor, blah, blah, blah. I'll be there. It's fine. You're welcome. Anyhow, that became kind of a contentious issue, and the, the place was jam-packed. Mm -hmm. He was sitting. This is the ballroom, the student union. The, the speaker's podium is here. He was sitting right over here in the front row. She gives her speech. She's just a little woman. We had to build a platform so she could see over the podium. <laughs> but as soon as she was done, his hand was up and he's standing up. His first question to this Jewish lady, have you ever accepted Jesus Christ as your savior? Do you know the Bible? <laughs> I mean, it was unbelievable. I thought the rest of the people were just gonna murder the guy right then. <laughs> but she was very calm. And she said, I've had that question asked many times, and I'd be delighted to sit down with you and, and talk about the Bible hmm. and what role Jesus plays in our history. And they continued to ask questions. She finally said, uh, there are a lot of questions, a lot of hands up here. Let me go around and take some other questions. Just have a chair. I'll come back to you. So he sits down. She goes around, and when she gets to the other side, and the last question, after a lengthy discussion, she steps down, which is a cue that it's done. This guy did not know it, but we planted two plainclothesmen on each side of him, and the ballroom has a series of doors to the back, and he was out in the hallway before you ever knew what would happen. <laughs> to keep him from claiming, which you can do, a citizen's arrest. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, I defended that decision to have her here mm -hmm. against great opposition opposed by the president of the university believing that especially my job is to, I'm the representative of students. Mm -hmm. And and so I, I believe very firmly that um, you needed to allow those things to happen and, and defend their, their action. And some others have not done that and they've been taken to court and usually lose. Mm -hmm. So th the bottom line is that, yeah, I became a very firm believer that um, people have the right to express their opinion as long as it's not violent and they're not yelling fire in a theater. Mm -hmm. I may not like it, and there are a lot of other people that may not like it, but uh, a function of a democracy is to allow that to occur. Absolutely. Has your job ever been put at risk because of your firm stance on yeah. freedom of speech? I, I, I moved from a five-acre lovely home in a wooded area uh, located about eight miles from town into a duplex in which I lived for two years, never knowing whether I was going to be called to the president's office the next morning and say, you got 30 days notice and clean your desk out now. I'll have somebody there to help escort you off the campus. Mm. What was the reasons behind that well, one? For my stand and allowing students to be expressive and showing films and, and challenging him. He, same person wanted to take $500,000 out of a, a, um, 
a fund, uh, auxiliary fund. Auxiliary funds are uh, residence halls where students pay money for a purpose, not mm -hmm. to be provided room and, and have uh, board, food. Uh, and you have to have reserves in order to pay bonds and maintain a rating and, and so you can borrow when you need to and the student union operates in large measure the same way as an auxiliary. Uh, in fact, a lot of things in the student services are based on auxiliary. The health center, the Cullen Recreation Center, but the only thing that isn't is the counseling center. Mm -hmm. And that's through state funds and, and small fees when the people that use them. Mm -hmm. um, and so when he told me that, I, sa I was in shock. I said, I, I suppose you as president, you have the authority to do that if it's approved by the regents. And, and, but if you do that, I'm going to tell the students, which stopped it immediately because he knew it wasn't right. But he was extremely angry and upset that, that I would take that stand. So I never really knew. I felt comfortable because I thought my relationships of the previous 10 years before he came with students and faculty was sufficient to, that I'll get their support. And I felt reasonably comfortable, but I didn't want to be hung with a house on property out in the woods that not everybody wants to live in. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, um, I, I'm just a firm believer, and I've said this to my my colleagues, my professional associates, uh, national meetings that um, if anybody's got to display a really a firm ethical behavior and, and um, stand for principle, it's us, that's our job. Mm -hmm. Even at the risk of losing your job. Absolutely. And, and there are a lot of people that won't do that. Um, well, take us uh, through the highlights of your career. Um, how, first, how long did you continue to work at Kent State? 12 years. Uh, I, I never initiated the application for a job, ever. Okay. The, the, going to Kent State was an invitation for a person. I was at, at Kent, I, and after that incident, I was very concerned. The president, after a year, was moved over to a full-time faculty job mm -hmm. in the College of Education, and they hired a new person. I continued as his executive assistant for two years. But it was so contentious, and such a maverick, and, and created such turmoil. One day, it was focused on this, and another week it was focused on that, and, and just, it was hard to, to, to know where he was going. Um, the guy that hired me at Kent had left and was the chancellor at the University of Nebraska, Omaha, mm -hmm. which had been, two years prior to his arrival, a, a community four-year college um, and a state college, kind of strange. And he did a lot of reorganization, and he announced a new position. They had been a dean of students, but never a chief student affairs officer. And he announced that, and, and he wrote me a letter, and he said, you ought to put your name in a pot. You're going to have to compete for that, but we've got a committee, students, faculty, staff, and the Board of Regents will make the final decision. So I did. I had great respect for him. I was concerned about what was happening at Kent Well, I was long story short, I was selected, and so in 1972, I went there as a vice chancellor for educational and student services. It included a radio and a television element, which is brand new to me, but that was part of the job. And, and I had some fundamental adherence to principle that says, I know what they're supposed to do, and they had a good person that oversaw that, so it wasn't a problem. Anyhow, um, I went there and was very happy. Um, that chancellor went to be the president of the University of Nebraska system. New chancellor came on, neat guy, loved working with him. <coughs> I got, <coughs> excuse me, I got a letter that said your name has been um, submitted in Oklahoma State because they've got a vacancy in the vice president. Mm. And I really didn't pay a lot of attention. I enjoyed Omaha, kids were in school, we liked where we lived. And, and somebody said, well, Beer, you ought to at least respond, mm -hmm. if nothing more for the experience. I, you know, you may not be here forever. I was fairly young. Um, so I said, okay. 
And so I submitted that, was invited. Um, I was then returned as one of three finalists and they invited my, my wife and family. So I came down and was offered the job. So I moved here in 1980, January, hmm. um, and was here for 20 years. What well, are some of your uh, favorite experiences here at Oklahoma State University? One of the attractions was to return to a residential campus. Omaha was a, was a commuter hmm. campus. I enjoyed it. It was a challenge, and we programmed differently. Hmm. Rather than at night, it was usually during the day, and, and there were different issues. But I wanted to get back to a residential campus where I thought you had greater um, impact on student life and the experiences they had. They lived in residence halls. You had staff there to facilitate them moving from a fairly protected environment of family, church, school, small friendship circle, to coming to a place they're now no longer overseen by mom and dad, mm -hmm. daily at least. Uh, they're creative, they're inquisitive, they're exploring, mm -hmm. which is a wonderful time of a person's life. Right. And, and so, our attitude was sometimes you got to let them sprain or break a finger or a hand or a leg, uh, but you can't let them break their back. Mm. And and so all of that is a part of that experience. And if they got beyond the boundaries, which we thought to be reasonable, we would address that. But it was a learning experience rather than what we viewed as a punitive experience. Mm. And and it may require to say, Jason, <laughs> you're going to have to take a break because you're going to be suspended for a semester because you cheated. Or, or you had a key and made entry and, and stole stuff that's unacceptable in this community. Mm -hmm. Or you were abusive to somebody at a level that we're concerned about, and you need to demonstrate that you can reflect on that, get some assistance, and, and prove to us that you can come back and be a member of our community. Mm -hmm. um, so I moved discipline from what then was the Dean of Students Office to the Counseling Center. People thought I was nuts. It shouldn't be affiliated. I said, what's, what's the purpose of, of, of a disciplinary, or disciplinary problem? Um, well, it's to change behavior. And I said, well, who's better trained to change behavior than a counselor? Come on. Mm -hmm. um, financial aid, when I got here, uh, I learned was not doing what it was supposed to do and reporting to the federal government. They had a dean of students when I came who had been responsible for a lot of things, including the student union, but rather than removing him from his position for ineptness and not doing what he's supposed to do, they just took stuff away. So when I came, he had responsibility for the counseling center and financial aid. I learned in about three months after arrival that financial aid was subject to a $350,000 fine by the federal government because they hadn't issued reports in the last five to seven years. <laughs> Why not? As a matter of fact, the director was the president of the National Association. Hmm. Well, I, I verified certain things and I fired the director of financial aid and the dean of students. Um, and he said, well, I'll see you in court. And I said, well, that's fine. Just tell me when and where and the time and I'll be there, which didn't happen. Um, so we modified that. We had a different director for staff and program in residence halls, one for maintenance and one for food service. Two of those retired uh, the third summer I was here, and rather than reappoint them, I put them all together under a director of housing, believing they're all related, hmm. and there shouldn't be competition, which there was, uh, for that. Um, financial aid, we created a whole new computerized system which hadn't been in place. Um, we eventually convinced Student, I, one of the, one of my requirements were for the eight directors was you must have a student advisory committee. And there were people that were very resistive of that. What do they know? They're just students. And I said, our our function is to provide service to students. And what better source to know what is needed and how to best go about that than engage the students? Well, they did that, and 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 the Colvin people resisted that dramatically, but they wanted a larger and newer facility, which was justified. So created a, a student advisory group. And they will lead the march, which they did. 
So they spent, I don't know, $14 million, $60 million, and demanded by students wow. <laughs> to create a fee to support a new facility, which is marvelous. Absolutely. Created a wellness center because a, a very wealthy alum came and said that we ought to focus more on wellness, and I, I thought, yeah, you're right. You know, people are reluctant to say, well, you're too heavy, you're too fat, you're too lazy. But that's costing society enormously. And, and we, we need to be, we need to confront that constructively, positively, supportively, you know. And, and the, the current president and his wife are just absolutely wonderful in focusing on wellness. Hmm. And it's not idle words. I mean, they talk about the healthiest campus and wanting to be the healthiest campus in the country. They put the money where their mouth is. Right. And, and they're, they're walking the talk. Well, it seems that throughout your career, you've led a very student-focused uh, very. Um, is that directly uh, attributable to the Kent State incident? Uh, did that have a significant impact on uh, your drive to be more student focused? I think it certainly had an impact, um, but I, I'm not. I don't know that it would be primary. I had okay. really good training, uh, education, uh, coursework at Michigan State and Kent State. My mentor. Okay. Was um, who was your mentor, by the way? Dr. Ronald Roskins. Okay. Um, just, I, I think one of the finest professionals and men and friends and his wife that I've ever known. Mm -hmm. um, but that and and uh, not being fearful of students. I, I don't know why. I, mean, I guess I've just been a very open. Uh, person interested in meeting new people. If I'm standing in a line, uh, I don't stand there and wait until I get there. I usually introduce myself or to a person and try to learn something about them and what they're doing. And that's led to saying, "Oh, I know a person who can help you with that." And, and you know, it's led to other kinds of things. Um, so I, I just think it's an, an openness and, and trust. As the Chief Student Affairs Officer, I always said to the Presidents and Vice Presidents of Student Government, one, I always gave them minimum of an hour every week if, if they wanted to come in and talk about something. Mm -hmm. And I, I said the first time we had a session, I said, Jason, uh, you're the President of the Student Body, and, and that's not just a game. That needs to be taken serious because you do have a responsibility to try to represent students. Mm -hmm. And if they've got concerns, you need to give that thoughtful consideration and, and, and try to determine what can be done and convey that openly and honestly. Hmm. I'm not one to play games. In fact, I will tell you things that I haven't even told my staff that are confidential that may be coming down. And I'll let you know if it's confidential. But if you ever violate it, I will never speak to you again. Hmm. I won't even say hello. I won't even recognize who you are. And in 28 years of this being a Chief Student Affairs Officer, that's never violated. Wow. But I believe firmly that if, if they were to be um, productive, effective, they needed to have information that I had when I was making a decision or what the President had. It's not rocket science generally, and it's not uncommon to come to the same conclusion and help to explain why that decision is made. Didn't always happen. I, I remember, for example, at, at Kent State, I told the president of the Black Student Association, I understand if you have to take a crack at us. You're representing the black students on the campus. Mm -hmm. And we're not always going to see eye to eye. And we will always not be we will not always be able to do what you need to do. But your responsibility is to express the concerns of your constituency. Mm -hmm. That's what it's all about. We knew that. He knew that. That I understood that. And I wasn't going to come and, and privately chastise him or threaten him or intimidate him kind of thing. I, I mean, it just, it's, it's a matter of developing a personal relationship. It's ethics. You with your spouse, your mom and dad, your brothers and sisters, your employer, your employees, the person that you do business with. 
if you've got strong, solid, ethical standards, you will always treat them right. You don't play games. You don't mislead them. You don't provide false information. Mm -hmm. You don't try to manipulate people. These people that think that they can change somebody that's got homosexual tendencies or outright and that they, that that's, you know, it's just an attitude kind of stuff and run, run them through this stuff. Where do they get this stuff? I mean, it's applicable in all kinds of things. And I don't think institutions of higher, educa higher education do a very good job of teaching that. Do you have um, any students that come to mind that you've made a significant impact on or that you'd like to mention, perhaps an episode with students? Yeah, I've, I've, I've suspended students who came back three or four years later and said thanks. Hmm. Yeah. Once they've had time to reflect on it. or Every so often, students are not very quick to say, you know, you're doing a good job. <laughs> we tend not to do that, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. But every once in a while, I'll get a letter and saying, you probably don't know me, maybe you don't even recognize my name, but I, I just want you to know that uh, a meeting I had with you seven years ago made a big difference in my life. Mm -hmm. I, I still maintain contact. There's a vice president student body that lives in China and a president, female president student body that lives in Australia that lived in uh, China for a long time. Um, a lady from Zimbabwe that um, we facilitated getting through, uh, who was the most interesting guest of Oprah Winfrey in all of her 25 years of interviews. Wow. Uh, Oprah Winfrey has interviewed a lot of people. Yeah. She also was one of three people. President Clinton, the governor of the state of Arkansas, and this lady on the platform of the dedication of the Clinton Library. Mm. This last year, she was the uh, speaker that, uh, pre uh, that opened the session of the United Nations prior to the general secretary giving his address. Wow. And most recently was the commencement speaker for all three commencements at Oklahoma State University and received an honorary degree. What was her name? Tererai Trent. Hmm. Her African name is Tererai Enyamanzi. Um, a woman who came with five kids, a reluctant husband, uh, who finally I sent home because he was abusive, hmm. much to his dismay, came back with AIDS we raised money to send him home so he could die. She finished not only her undergraduate, but her master's degree here and got a PhD at Western Michigan. That's a long, complicated story that I'd be delighted to tell, but I, I'm going to have to wrap this up here. And okay. My wife says I promised her to do some things this afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, before I ask my final question, is there anything throughout this interview that you wanted to discuss that you, I haven't asked? No, not really. Like you said, we could talk all afternoon. Yes, sir. <laughs> and there are, you know, some other experiences that come to mind at, at Kent State and, and at Nebraska um, and here that um, are fascinating. Sure. Yeah. Um, when history is recorded, what would you like it to say about you? Uh uh, I guess that um, I worked very hard at being an ethical person, being honest in relationships, um, devoting a lot of time and energy to perform the tasks for which I was employed and paid to do, um, to being open and considerate of people with other thoughts and ideas and a way of life that <clears throat> our way is not the only way. I think seven very specific trips to Mozambique, Africa and working in a village is, and uh, another semester at sea where we went to um, a dozen countries over three months has helped to 
create an understanding of that. Wow. Another story. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> well, Dr. Beer, on behalf of all students, I'd like to thank you for your dedication to students' rights. Thank you. And on behalf of historians, I would like to thank you for sharing your experiences with us. Hope it might be helpful to somebody down the road. I'm sure it will. That um, is willing to listen. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.